So Laura Berman, um, I didn't know it, but I probably met her years ago because she had a chance to start printmaking uh, at Flatbed when we were located on the West Third Street, our very, very first location. Laura reminded me of that, is that she took us um, a class there that met only on Saturdays. And I'm sure we'll hear more from her about how she, what she learned from that class or what, how, what attracted her to printmaking through there. Uh, Laura went on to uh, attend uh, Alfred University and got her BFA from Alfred University and then went to the M get her MFA at Tulane University. Um, I, uh, this is such a coincidence because I had not remembered meeting Laura, but I happened to see this book uh, back in, I think it was 2010. And, I, and on the cover is uh, a close up of one of Laura's uh, installations of prints that was featured at the Southern Graphics Council in uh, San Francisco of that same year. Um, and I remember being really enthralled by what she was doing. Um, Laura has um, not only been published in this book, but also in contemporary printmaking and a survey of contemporary, this is the survey of contemporary printmaking and a new book that's coming up called um, Color Theories by uh, Erin Fine. So um, she now is a professor of printmaking at the Kansas City Art Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. So Laura, welcome. And I'm so glad that you uh, uh, responded and, and have this exhibition at Flatbed. We're glad that you're here. Thank you, Catherine. What a lovely introduction. Um, wish we were there in person, but, <laughs> but this is the next best thing. Um, I really appreciate it. It's really an honor for me to, to exhibit my work at Flatbed with just like you mentioned, because it's a full circle opportunity for me. Um, after, after working there as an emerging artist in a Saturday class and having the accessibility to the studio that Flatbed offered, as well as like an entree to what a great art community Austin has. I also joined Women Printmakers of Austin that year. And that was, I think I was the youngest person there by many years, but it was just delightful to be part of that group and exhibit some of the work I was making at the time. I think the only, I mean, the work I was making at the time was very picky. <laughs> I guess is a good word to say. Um, I think one of the one of the main lessons I learned because the community um, aspect of the studio it was a very small studio, you know, for a group of people to be working at at a time, um, was to keep my colors to myself, which is kind of a funny anecdote. But, but in a community in a community studio, you know, things that other people are using are very enthralling, and sometimes my colors would um, be enticing to other artists. And what started happening is people would use my colors, and then their prints would sell. So, <laughs> so it was kind of a good lesson to learn as a very young artist to, oh, wait, this is kind of my special thing. I need to kind uh -huh. of keep this close uh -huh. to keep my palette to myself. <laughs> Now, yes. was that um, before you went to school at um, the, the uh, Alfred uh, University? Was that before you did that? After. So I had recently gotten my, M my BFA, but it was before I went to work on my MFA. Okay. And did you feel like when you went to do an MFA, you wanted to concentrate on printmaking? Or was that just something that came later? Definitely. So yeah, I focused on printmaking as an undergraduate. And I worked with neon as well <laughs> at Alfred. So I did some sculptural things too. Um, there was a really robust glass blowing program at Alfred. At the time, I'm sure it still is. Um, and a lot of my friends were hand pulling um, cane that would that they could then put into neon, take up to the neon shop. And so we were playing a lot with color in that fashion because we had control over the color of the glass, the color of the gas that goes into it and then whether the glass was transparent or translucent. Uh -huh. So there was like this sort of like color theory thing going on in the neon department. So I had a lot of fun working with those artists as well. That makes such sense, Laura, because the prints that are here seem so um, about the light that comes through them. And almost like a gesso, because the light's bouncing off of the paper behind the color. It just seems pretty vibrant in the, the colors that you use. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, how, how printmaking practices develop and morph, you know, through other things that we do. Yeah. Um, it, one of the things that really intrigued me uh, reading about you too is that a lot of, you refer to yourself as an image maker, not necessarily a printmaker. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, you, you asked me that earlier and I kind of had to think about it. What, what was my reason of putting those words together? <laughs> um, something that I've done, especially in my role as a professor and a teacher is to study the function of images in our world. Because prints always, print making as a discipline, as a field always has one foot in the commercial and industrial side of, of material, basically. It's, it also has a foot in fine art. But I, you know, thinking about multiples and how they function and kind of playing that out into the role of the artist. Um, I do believe there is a lot of responsibility that artists have um, for the work that they put out into the world. And even if it's as simple as an image that's going to get thrown away later, like junk mail or something, <laughs> um, that's still a print and that's something that's it's printed matter. Um, and and there is there is sort of this tie that, I don't know, there's sort of a humbleness to, to even the most like inexpensive thing in the world of printmaking. So, mm -hmm. um, but also a, a, an importance to that too. So that's kind of when I say image maker, I mean, it's material, you know, because I paint and I work with collage as well. So I, I create works on paper primarily. Mm -hmm. um, mostly it's in the printmaking land, but sometimes there's other media involved. So I'm not the most traditional printmaker. I understand that. And I mean, it's, I, I love the philosophy of it. I mean, it's about making art and instead of necessarily making something that you could classify as a print. Um, uh, some of you, if you haven't seen the exhibition, uh, Laura, you have so many beautiful collages here too. And those collages look like they might have been taken from remnants of the prints that you've you've done. Is that how? And they are very object like the images that you're making. Can you mm -hmm. tell me about those? Absolutely. Yeah, you've got it. Um, so for the past, well, you know, there's always these sort of like Oops. Oh, there's always these byproducts in um, in the printing process. You know, like it's one of the jokes that printmakers make is, you know, the the image looks better on newsprint than any other kind of paper. You know, so so we always wish, you know, could we save those news newsprints? Could we save those proofs and make something else out of them? So um, for the past two or three years, I've been um, printing my ghost prints, which is really a byproduct of cleaning my printing plates onto nice paper, which is a cotton archival paper that I print on. Um, so scraps of that paper are kind of accumulating these, um, these byproducts like cleaning process prints of my plates when I'm from making my quote, you know, real work or my more realized work. And then I realized this year, I just had a huge stack of all, all of these um, scraps that were fully printed and ready to go. I had a, um, I went on an artist residency in May at Goodhart Artist Residency in um, Northern Michigan, and it was amazing. It's not a printmaking residency though. So I was in, I was working with paper and paint and collage during that residency. So yeah, this one's perfect. I came up with this technique of using painted papers in this um, very intricate, like pattern-based collage format. And so when I came back to my studio from that two-week residency, I was able to bring this new technique and create these larger pieces. And you actually, the, the gallery exhibition has that series of painted pieces too. It's the um, unio, unio pieces that are like light green and they look like sea glass kind of. One's right over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a little series of five. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to it. There they are. <laughs> yeah. They, I, I examined them up close and I wasn't sure if they were painted on or if they were uh, from prints. And I'm really glad to know that's, that you are ghosting and using those prints. Because I thought that if you were destroying a lot of prints, that would be a lot of prints to have cut up to, to uh, come up with all these. These have such wonderful three-dimensional qualities to them, the way they feel folded. Yeah. 
Definitely. Yeah. The idea of like these lines becoming shapes and then becoming forms and that sort of path of abstraction of like coming back into a real thing <laughs> through an abstract process really, I think really works with this technique in the series. Yeah, those are really, those are really gorgeous. I enjoyed those. And I, um, another, you know, I've had the benefit of being able to be in this space for uh, the last, I guess it's been two weeks now. And I've um, come to enjoy uh, the title that you gave it, the temporalities title, because I didn't understand that when you, you actually titled it that. And I'm living here with these pieces that feel like that they took time. I feel like I entered your time. Can you tell me about that title and why you decided to title it that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a bit of a bold move. <laughs> But yeah, definitely it's about time. I And I think like probably everybody, like time has become a kind of different thing in my life in the past two years than what I've ever really considered it to be. Um, in my experience in the past two years, time has really changed. It's really deepened. To me, time seems more vast and also more pliable and like less of a constraint. So the works in this show really challenge and both harness time in combination with my hand to the imagery in the exhibition. Um, in my recent work, perception was, a, was more of a focus, like how we see and how we can see things deeply. But now in addition to this, my newest work talks about how we experience seeing like through time. So that becomes more of a focus as well. There's kind of a constant motion in the works, especially when you can see a series of them, because you can kind of see all the different actions that take place over time to change one part to the next or one color to the next. Um, I can kind of imagine each of these images being a snapshot of time, or maybe like a slice of something larger than itself. Maybe that's even biological. Um, and also in regard to time, when I'm making this work, even though these are very peaceful images in some ways. My body is constantly in motion in the studio. Mm -hmm. This was one of my favorites. Oh, yes, let's take a look at um, how, you, how you create the work. This is, I haven't seen this video yet. This is good. Um, I'm impressed with your colors and if anyone can, you probably did just watch some of these images or if you see them up close, you'll be impressed with the gradation of color that happens within almost every image that you create. And the colors are unusual. They're not out of the box, are they, Laura? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell us a little about your colors. Yeah, there's an extensive palette kind of going on at all times in my studio. <laughs> um, I mean, I could spend you know days just mixing colors to prepare for printing. And I do, I often do, do that accumulatively over time. Um, so color to me in general is, I mean, there is an improvisational um, quality to how I, how I work with color, but it's really about the relationships and the sort of the families of colors that I'm putting together. So like in this part of my printing process, you can see the overlapping layers and how those colors start to intercombine together to create a whole new color that I didn't even mix. Like that, the new colors are just what happens when the colors come together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using transparency a lot in my work. Like I'll go through five pound cans of transparency, like water in my studio while I'm still working on 10, 10 year old, you know, little cans of ink <laughs> to mm -hmm. sort of bring the pigment in. Mm -hmm. So color to me is about iteration and it's about sort of the journey from one to the next to the next and the idea of like a family or these connections between um, different fields of color. Do you, you say improv improvisational, do you know, or do you have a composition that you're going for when you start? I mean, you're showing the ones, like the ones that you see behind me that mm -hmm. fill the whole page. Uh, they're not object-like and not like the other ones that were more gems. And I'm wondering how improvisational those were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, in this video, I actually am working on a commission piece that was pretty specific to like a pre-designed um, image that I had. Um, and it's a piece for a hospital. Um, and that 
it's kind of a long story, but, but um, I, I did want to be as true to my design for that piece as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, it, it, I might come in with like an idea of maybe a beautiful sunset I saw recently, or what about wintry colors? Or boy, I'm so cold. What about, you know, summery colors? Or like, it's really sort of what I, what do I feel like I'm in the mood for color wise that day? I all, I always want to make colors that I feel look really yummy, like things that I, are very appealing to me, like an essential, like I could eat them. I mean, I never would do that with my ink, but you know, like that are just really, it's hard to put into words, you know, but yeah. So there is a, there is a process of me engaging with, with my color mixing too, that I always want it to be in that territory of this is fun. This is delicious. I love, you know, I'm surprised how much I love this, et cetera. Um, and I feel like that does translate in my work. There is sort of that sense of discovery and joy, even for viewers of my work. Well, I enjoyed, I, I didn't know the names of some of your colors. So uh, <laughs> if people have a chance to look at the video of of Laura mixing color, you'll notice some colors are honey, ripe, ripe melon, right? Right. And then um, what was the Minnesota Lake? Lake <laughs> water, Lake water. I like that one a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, if you were down here in this part of the country or the high plains, you might have something called high plains sky. I mean, there's some, I can see how they relate to uh, something that you've experienced or seen. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of felt maybe yeah the titles I can't I can't claim the titles because that was from a um a, a like an Instagram takeover I did with Speedball and when I was I on there, when I was in their Instagram I asked the Speedball audience for color titles <laughs> and oh, so they, that they it was. titles and then I got to decide what that looked like oh. <laughs> but then I did the that. Over <laughs> and saw their colors yeah <laughs> Next time you do it, I want to be a part of that one. That's yeah, well, these are uh, this is great. I, I'm I'm sure a lot of people out there have questions too. Have we got any any questions in the chat room yet? Anybody want to add to that? I've got an audience here at the shop too right now that we are all listening to you. And does anybody here have questions? While we're waiting, I, 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 want, I want to go back just a little bit. I was going to ask you how printmaking, um, you know, how did it become a part of your practice? You may have studied ceramics and you've done, what, what kind of propelled you into doing more uh, printmaking than other types of uh, works? So I, ha I can see it in my studio. I have something I can show you. <laughs> If, I don't know if I should bring you with me. I don't want to make you dizzy on the screen, but <laughs> um, so it was it was from taking a sculpture class in college that I discovered printmaking was for me. And I had already um, studied printmaking for a semester with Jessie Sheffrin, and she was a really great teacher and really challenging um, conceptually and you know physically. I was very challenged in the studio and I was up for that challenge. Um, and so this was when I was in college at Alfred. And then I, the next semester I took a sculpture class and it was, I was, I, it just was not my world. And I, it was very hard for me and very challenging. And I um, just felt really out of place. So it's sort of like I had to do the wrong thing in order to discover what the right thing was. Mm -hmm. And what happened in that sculpture class is that I made this piece and I keep it in my studio because it's like so dear. So it's a, it's a for, hand forged piece of steel that's got enamel on both sides yeah. and it's really not special <laughs> like I remember the teacher saying I don't really care how you made that form it's really like there's nothing remarkable about it but how did you do the enamel like because I, I was in the enamel studio for days like just laying down different layers and refiring it laying down different layers and refiring it and then I realized I think I'm missing printmaking because <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. I've been working on steel plates I learned etching on is that right? Yeah, on steel. Yeah. You use steel, like galvanized, the galvanized yeah. kind? Was it steel? Was yeah. it really thin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was like hydrochloric. I mean, it was like. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I loved the process of printing. Um, so it was a great experience, even if I after that I only worked on copper. <laughs> Laura, that sculptural piece reminds me of a painting that's in our studio, the one that the, with the, the line, I've forgotten the title. And that's the one where I really got in touch with your time. It was because I realized every time you put a stroke of color down, you probably had to wait a long time before you put another one over it. Uh, and so you, you know, I, I understood you're coming back and forth to, uh, in time to do that. That yeah. was, yeah, that does remind me of that one. For sure. Yeah, that one's, I think it's called like a cross or something. I'm thinking about the landscape in the series as well. These are tiny paintings. So these are made on like the ends of my printmaking paper. Uh huh. Really beautiful little tiny pieces of paper that are, you know, hardly bigger than the size of my hand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they are. And, but they're, they're gorgeous studies. I really enjoyed all these watercolors a lot. Thank you. Um, you know, you mentioned on your, on your, um, um, about the um, speedball chat or the speedball uh, Zoom that you did. Do you mostly use uh, oil-based sinks or water-based sinks or what, somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, what kinds of brands of ink do you use and what do you like about them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, for the speedball video, I used their inks. They have a professional relief line of inks, which is water miscible. And I don't use those inks in my studio, but I use them in where I teach um, because they're so great for workshops because students, especially beginning printmaker, printmaking students, cleanup can be like, you know, so arduous. <laughs> So if you can just take it to the sink and wash it off with soap and water, it's like so, it's so remarkable. So there's, they're not, the, the, the professional relief inks they have are soy, um, soy oil based. Mm -hmm. So they are oil based, but they're, they do clean up with soap and water, which is great. Um, in my studio, I use all of my inks are from Graphic Chemical, which is just the ink I started with. <laughs> when I was learning and it was like the, the most prevalent, you know, printmaking supply company in the country for many years, even through my graduate school experience. Um, so when I started buying my own inks, that's what I bought. And I've learned over time that, I don't know if it's because I'm using some modifiers with my inks too, especially the transparency that sometimes different brands of ink don't play well together. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also I'm really like already stretching the capabilities of every color I work with. So um, I just keep everything in the same family. So everything I use is from Graphic Chemical mm -hmm. and it's all oil-based. And I've been, the prints that are behind you, Catherine, you know, this is a relief process where I'm rolling the ink onto plates. And this is a process I've been doing now consistently since 2007. So I have a lot of expertise in how to handle the ink in this particular process. Right. So you're rolling it onto plates that are pre-cut. It looks like they are cut out of maybe mat board or something like that. Correct. Yeah. I use a variety of materials. Like these are a thick paper, mm -hmm. um, a poster board type paper, but sometimes I'll use wood. Um, sometimes I'll use, I mean, I, you know, I love making collagraphs. I mean, like anything that's sort of textural that can be cut into a shape. Like I'm a very scissor happy artist, obviously. <laughs> so these are all these plates are hand cut um, unless they're on wood and then they're laser cut. We have another question is from Alyssa. Are your watercolors used as studies for your prints? Yes, they are. They wow. are. There's a story there. Um, so this, I'm in my studio right now, which is in the garage of my house. And the year that my studio, like the year after we bought the house, I um, had our second child. And then like right after he was born, this studio was um, renovated to be a studio. So I was with kind of without a studio and without the time <laughs> during that pregnancy and you know, his early life to make work as a printmaker. So I ended up using the bathroom at my house to start these um, little watercolor paintings. <laughs> And the bathroom, there's one, it was right next to the bedroom, like where baby was sleeping. So if I needed to attend to him or help him in the middle of the night, because usually it was about 2 a.m. is when I was wide awake <laughs> for about an hour, um, you know, a couple times a week. So I could go in the bathroom, it had great lighting, had water, you know, a nice long counter. <laughs> so I could <laughs> lay my artwork out in these little tiny studies. And after a year, I had a hundred tiny paintings. 
Yeah. I know. Wow. <laughs> so, so previously to that, I had been using my rock collection as my like muse. So I, I would trace them and use the shapes of them and the contours of all these, you know, huge variety of little rocks that I collect. And after I started the painting series, I started using my paintings as my muse um, yeah. that I, I would then trace and bring the shapes back into to my larger prints. I'm so, glad yeah. you mentioned those rocks. Yeah. yeah because I yeah. under you know, the painting that really drew me to your work or the print that did the installation uh, is composed of how many rocks? It looks like about 200. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah it's 220, but they're repeated like five or six times. So it's about 1,500 hand cut intaglio prints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're, they're one to one scale. So those little rocks are like, they, they fit in your pocket in real mm -hmm. life. But the prints also are like one inch or two inches. <laughs> are you still an avid rock collector? Yeah, for yeah. sure. And now my kids are too. It's so funny. You should see us at a rock. We, when we came to Austin, we actually went to a rock shop. <laughs> and we had some good ones around here. Good ones. Yeah. <laughs> Were they all were they all done off of hand, uh, plates? I know you cut the prints out. Were they all done off of copper plates or anything? Different? So for the yeah, for that piece with the little rock prints, those are laser engraved on masonite. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So it was like er really early in laser engraving time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I traced, I created templates in Illustrator from scanning the rocks and. It was a process digitally, um, but I have still have the plates and I can use them, you know, whenever I want. Mm -hmm. do, you still, do you use much laser cutting uh, now for your templates or for how do you use it? I do. I do use laser cutting um, sometimes. I'm trying to think. Yeah, this year I actually did laser cutting with a print. I don't know if you can see it, but that one that's on my wall right there with the two the round circles. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has like two like nesting circles yeah. those are all laser cut thin like ribs almost of wood uh -huh. so that's based on a tiny painting that, that I the print is almost 24 by 24 inches and the painting was like five by five inches is that something currently you're working on or where are you yeah anything that we should be aware of about what <laughs> Yes, that is definitely the current direction. Um, and the collages, I'm hoping to grow larger even. 20 mm -hmm. by 20 inches is kind of the largest I've gone. Those are at, at the gallery right now. Those are some of my, I mean, I made those works just a few months ago. Those are really new works. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to even take this up a, up a scale. And I'm also, um, some of my um, byproducts like ghost printing I've been doing onto canvas. So I'm also working with stitching canvas together and creating kind of a collaged canvas um, piece as well. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, we're excited. Uh, might as well tell, we're, we're hoping that uh, Laura can come to uh, Flatbed this year and collaborate with us here on perhaps a lithograph is what we've been thinking about. We're, we're hoping that that will happen. And uh, I think that would be wonderful. So um, any other questions? Yeah, do we have another one? Oh, I missed one. Um, Oh, are there any environmental inspirations like the water or ocean as well? Sounds yeah, like, yeah, I think, yeah, you would yeah. that a little bit already, yeah. Also the body. So like the prints behind you are based on um, drawings I've made of heart rate scans of my kids. These, these, mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Say that again, I've missed it, I'm sorry. They're, the, they're based on hand-drawn, um, hand-drawn paintings I've made of heart rate scans of my children. So it's like these heartbeats, basically, mm -hmm. that are all, they're all abstracted. They're kind of blown out and overlapped and rearranged. Um, mm -hmm. But pretty much all the other work in the show, it does kind of stem from my exploration of the landscape near where I live in Kansas City. And I think the Texas landscape would have a lot of affinity with, <laughs> with how I'm going to describe this, which is basically these vast open spaces of Kansas where um, you can really kind of put yourself out in the middle of nowhere and there's like no mediation between you, the land and the sky. Like there's no telephone poles, there's no roads. There's, there's um, places where you can just go kind of walk with the cattle, you know, <laughs> like out on the land and see nothing. <laughs> um, there's an, a region in Kansas and also goes um, up from Nebraska down to Oklahoma a little bit called the Flint 
Flint Hills. And the land under the grass is all rock. It's flint rock. And it's not, it's actually limestone. I mean, it was an inland sea in the Permian age. And so nothing really grows there. Like they can't, there's no, there's not much ag agriculture or farming. So really all it all it is can serve in terms of agriculture is, is cattle industry and ranching. <laughs> but you know, there is a state park and tall grass prairie national park. And this is all just about two hours south um, west of Kansas City where I live. So in getting to know that landscape um, over the last 10 years, really um, closely, like my husband and I, my family and I own a house in that part of Kansas as well. And we rent it, but we also host artists there too. It's called Prairie Side Cottage. I'm gonna ask you about yeah. that. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so that's the landscape there. And that landscape has really inspired me. And it's, it's there's sort of that timelessness part and that it's really a profound, I'm sure everyone has had this feeling somewhere, you know, at some point where you just feel very small <laughs> and like, but at the same time, very connected, you know, it's sort of like this time stops and I don't know, you know, it's just, it's kind of a similar feeling I had when I became a mother too. It's just this like universal connection, but then this sort of timeless purpose. Oh, so. well, yes, <laughs> I understand. Uh <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the residency. So you host artists out there as well as yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. I just put on our website like Sunday, like just yesterday, um, the four artists that we'll have in the next two years. And you know, we host about two artists a year. It's a very small program. Um, we don't the house is a vacation rental property and we go there too as a family. Our kids love it. Um, but we don't make any money on it, you know, like, so um, the house based on who's renting it and who's staying there kind of, that just pays for the house to have internet and gas and whatever. <laughs> um, and then we can kind of host a couple artists a year affordably as well. So it's an application process. And I think in this fall, this fall, the applications open again for like 2023. So it's always like a ways out. But yeah. Oh, very generous. We've had over 20 artists and writers since 2014, like officially hosted. So. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. Yeah, this has been great. I've, yeah. I've loved getting to know, know more. I mean, I, a lot of the ideas I had about how you worked were wrong. I'm really glad to know more. <laughs> And that's what you're thinking. <laughs> I didn't talk even more about the, the colors, but um, I think we've 45 minutes ought to be about right for everybody. It sure. last last chance if anybody has a, anything to add or ask. No? Okay. Laura, thank you so much. Yeah, thank for you. Doing this. Yeah. And we'll post this and if you want to share it, or and we're looking forward to seeing you again before too long. Sounds great. Thank you, Catherine and everybody at Flatbed. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. All right. We're signing off, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and attending. And if you can, if you're in town, please get by and see these beautiful pieces in person. Thank you. <laughs>